Chapter 4 of The Wealth of Nations, Book 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Chapter 4 of Book 3. How the Commerce of Towns Contributed to the Improvement of the Country. The increase in riches of commercial and manufacturing towns contributed to the improvement and cultivation of the countries to which they belonged in three different ways. First, by affording a great and ready market for the rude produce of the country, they gave encouragement to its cultivation and further improvement. This benefit was not even confined to the countries in which they were situated, but extended more or less to all those with which they had any dealings. To all of them they afforded a market for some part either of their rude or manufactured produce, and, consequently, gave some encouragement to the industry and improvement of all. Their own country, however, on account of its neighborhood, necessarily derived the greatest benefit from this market. Its rude produce being charged with less carriage, the traders could pay the growers a better price for it, and yet afford it as cheap to the consumers as that of more distant countries. Secondly, the wealth acquired by the inhabitants of cities was frequently employed in purchasing such lands as were to be sold, of which a great part would frequently be uncultivated. Merchants are commonly ambitious of becoming country gentlemen, and when they do, they are generally the best of all improvers. A merchant is accustomed to employ his money chiefly in profitable projects, whereas a mere country gentleman is accustomed to employ it chiefly in expense the one often sees his money go from him and return to him again with a profit the other when once he parts with it very seldom expects to see any more of it those different habits naturally affect their temper and disposition in every sort of business the merchant is commonly a bold a country gentleman a timid undertaker the one is not afraid to lay out at once a large capital upon the improvement of his land when he has a probable prospect of raising the value of it in proportion to the expense the other if he has any capital which is not always the case seldom ventures to employ it in this manner if he improves at all it is commonly not with a capital but with what he can save out of his annual revenue Whoever has had the fortune to live in a mercantile town, situated in an unimproved country, must have frequently observed how much more spirited the operations of merchants were in this way than those of mere country gentlemen. The habits, besides, of order, economy, and attention, to which mercantile business naturally forms a merchant, render him much fitter to execute, with profit and success, any project of improvement. Thirdly, and lastly, Commerce and manufacturers gradually introduced order and good government, and with them the liberty and security of individuals, among the inhabitants of the country, who had before lived almost in a continual state of war with their neighbors, and of servile dependency upon their superiors. This, though it has been the least observed, is by far the most important of all their effects. Mr. Hume is the only writer who, so far as I know, has hitherto taken notice of it. In a country which has neither foreign commerce nor any of the finer manufactures, a great proprietor, having nothing for which he can exchange the greater part of the produce of his lands which is over and above the maintenance of the cultivators, consumes the whole in rustic hospitality at home. If this surplus produce is sufficient to maintain a hundred or a thousand men, he can make use of it in no other way than by maintaining a hundred or a thousand men. He is, at all times, therefore, surrounded with a multitude of retainers and dependents, who, having no equivalent to give in return for their maintenance, but being fed entirely by his bounty, must obey him, for the same reason that soldiers must obey the prince who pays them. Before the extension of commerce and manufactures in Europe, the hospitality of the rich and the great, from the sovereign down to the smallest baron, exceeded everything which, in the present times, we can easily form a notion of. Westminster Hall was the dining-room of William Rufus, and might frequently, perhaps, not be too large for his company. It was reckoned a piece of magnificence in Thomas Becket that he strewed the floor of his hall with clean hay or rushes in the season, in order that the knights and squires, who could not get seats, might not spoil their fine clothes when they sat down on the floor to eat their dinner. The great Earl of Warwick is said to have entertained every day, at his different manners, thirty thousand people, and though the number here may have been exaggerated, it must, however, have been very great to admit of such exaggeration. 
a hospitality nearly of the same kind was exercised not many years ago in many different parts of the highlands of scotland it seems to be common in all nations to whom commerce and manufactures are little known i have seen says dr pocock an arabian chief dine in the streets of a town where he had come to sell his cattle and invite all passengers even common beggars to sit down with him and partake of his banquet the occupiers of land were in every respect as dependent upon the great proprietor as his retainers even such of them as were not in a state of villainage were tenants at will who paid a rent in no respect equivalent to the subsistence which the land afforded them a crown half a crown a sheep a lamb was some years ago in the highlands of scotland a common rent for lands which maintained a family in some places it is so at this day nor will money at present purchase a greater quantity of commodities there than in other places in a country where the surplus produce of a large estate must be consumed upon the estate itself it will frequently be more convenient for the proprietor that part of it be consumed at a distance from his own house provided they who consume it are as dependent upon him as either his retainers or his menial servants. He is thereby saved from the embarrassment of either too large a company or too large a family. A tenant at will, who possesses land sufficient to maintain his family for little more than a quit rent, is as dependent upon the proprietor as any servant or retainer whatever, and must obey him with as little reserve such a proprietor as he feeds his servants and retainers at his own house so he feeds his tenants at their houses the subsistence of both is derived from his bounty and its continuance depends upon his good pleasure upon the authority which the great proprietors necessarily had in such a state of things over their tenants and retainers was founded the power of the ancient barons they necessarily became the judges in peace and the leaders in war of all who dwelt upon their estates they could maintain order and execute the law within their respective domains because each of them could there turn the whole force of all the inhabitants against the injustice of any one no other person had sufficient authority to do this the king in particular had not in those ancient times he was little more than the greatest proprietor in his dominions to whom for the sake of common defence against their common enemies the other great proprietors paid certain respects to have enforced payment of a small debt within the lands of a great proprietor where all the inhabitants were armed and accustomed to stand by one another would have cost the king had he attempted it by his own authority almost the same effort as to extinguish a civil war he was therefore obliged to abandon the administration of justice through the greater part of the country to those who were capable of administering it and for the same reason to leave the command of the country militia to those whom that militia would obey it is a mistake to imagine that those territorial jurisdictions took their origin from the feudal law not only the highest jurisdictions both civil and criminal but the power of levying troops of coining money and even that of making by-laws for the government of their own people were all rights possessed allodially by the great proprietors of land several centuries before even the name of the feudal law was known in europe the authority and jurisdiction of the saxon lords in england appear to have been as great before the conquest as that of any of the norman lords after it but the feudal law is not supposed to have become the common law of england till after the conquest that the most extensive authority and jurisdictions were possessed by the great lords in france allodially long before the feudal law was introduced into that country is a matter of fact that admits of no doubt that authority and those jurisdictions all necessarily flowed from the state of property and manners just now described without remounting to the remote antiquities of either the french or english monarchies we may find in much later times many proofs that such effects must always flow from such causes it is not thirty years ago since mr cameron of lochiel a gentleman of lochaber in scotland without any legal warrant whatever not being what was then called a lord of regality nor even a tenant-in-chief but a vassal of the duke of argyle and without being so much as a justice of the peace used notwithstanding to exercise the highest criminal jurisdictions over his own people he is said to have done so with great equity though without any of the formalities of justice and it is not improbable that the state of that part of the country at that time made it necessary for him to assume this authority in order to maintain the public peace that gentleman whose rent never exceeded five hundred pounds a year 
carried, in 1745, 800 of his own people into the rebellion with him. The introduction of the feudal law, so far from extending, may be regarded as an attempt to moderate the authority of the great allodial lords. It established a regular subordination, accompanied with a long train of services and duties, from the king down to the smallest proprietor. During the minority of the proprietor, the rent, together with the management of his lands, fell into the hands of his immediate superior, and consequently those of all great proprietors into the hands of the king, who was charged with the maintenance and education of the pupil, and who, from his authority as guardian, was supposed to have a right of disposing of him in marriage, provided it was in a manner not unsuitable to his rank. But though this institution necessarily tended to strengthen the authority of the king, and to weaken that of the great proprietors, it could not do either sufficiently for establishing order and good government among the inhabitants of the country, because it could not alter sufficiently that state of property and manners from which the disorders arose. The authority of government still continued to be, as before, too weak in the head, and too strong in the inferior members and the excessive strength of the inferior members was the cause of the weakness of the head. After the institution of feudal subordination, the king was as incapable of restraining the violence of the great lords as before. They still continued to make war according to their own discretion, almost continually upon one another, and very frequently upon the king, and the open country still continued to be a scene of violence, rapine, and disorder. But what all the violence of the feudal institutions could never have effected, the silent and insensible operation of foreign commerce and manufactures gradually brought about. These gradually furnished the great proprietors with something for which they could exchange the whole surplus produce of their lands, and which they could consume themselves without sharing it either with tenants or retainers. All for ourselves, and nothing for our people, seems, in every age of the world, to have been the vile maxim of the masters of mankind. As soon, therefore, as they could find a method of consuming the whole value of their rents themselves, they had no disposition to share them with any other persons. For a pair of diamond buckles, perhaps, or for something as frivolous and useless, they exchanged the maintenance, or, what is the same thing, the price of the maintenance of one thousand men for a year, and with it the whole weight and authority which it could give them. The buckles, however, were to be all their own, and no other human creature was to have any share of them whereas, in the more ancient method of expense, they must have shared with at least one thousand people. With the judges that were to determine the preference, this difference was perfectly decisive, and thus for the gratification of the most childish, the meanest and most sordid of all vanities, they gradually bartered their whole power and authority. In a country where there is no foreign commerce, nor any of the finer manufactures, a man of ten thousand pounds a year cannot well employ his revenue in any other way than in maintaining, perhaps, one thousand families, who are all of them necessarily at his command. In the present state of Europe, a man of ten thousand pounds a year can spend his whole revenue, and he generally does so, without directly maintaining twenty people, or being able to command more than ten footmen, not worth the commanding. Indirectly, perhaps, he maintains as great, or even a greater number of people, than he could have done by the ancient method of expense. For though the quantity of precious productions for which he exchanges his whole value be very small, the number of workmen employed in collecting and preparing it must necessarily have been very great. Its great price generally arises from the wages of their labor, and the profits of all their immediate employers. By paying that price, he indirectly pays all those wages and profits, and thus indirectly contributes to the maintenance of all the workmen and their employers. He generally contributes, however, but a very small proportion to that of each. To a very few, perhaps not a tenth, to many not a hundredth, and to some not a thousandth, or even a ten thousandth part of their whole annual maintenance. Though he contributes, therefore, to the maintenance of them all, they are all more or less independent of him, because generally they can all be maintained without him. When the great proprietors of land spent their rents in maintaining their tenants and retainers, each of them maintains entirely all his own tenants and all his own retainers. But when they spend them in maintaining tradesmen and artificers, they may, all of them taken together, perhaps maintain as great, or, on account of the waste which attends rustic hospitality, a greater number of people than before. Each of them, however, taken singly, contributes often but a very small share to the maintenance of any individual of this greater number. 
Each tradesman or artificer derives his subsistence from the employment, not of one, but of a hundred or a thousand different customers. Though in some measure obliged to them all, therefore, he is not absolutely dependent upon any one of them. The personal expense of the great proprietors having in this manner gradually increased, it was impossible that the number of their retainers should not as gradually diminish, till they were at last dismissed altogether. The same cause gradually led them to dismiss the unnecessary part of their tenants. Farms were enlarged, and the occupiers of land, notwithstanding the complaints of depopulation, reduced to the number necessary for cultivating it, according to the imperfect state of cultivation and improvement in those times. By the removal of the unnecessary mouths, and by exacting from the farmer the full value of the farm, a greater surplus, or, what is the same thing, the price of a greater surplus, was obtained for the proprietor, which the merchants and manufacturers soon furnished him with a method of spending upon his own person, in the same manner as he had done the rest. The cause continuing to operate, he was desirous to raise his rents above what his lands, in the actual state of their improvement, could afford. His tenants could agree to this upon one condition only, that they should be secured in their possession for such a term of years as might give them time to recover, with profit, whatever they should lay not in the further improvement of the land. The expensive vanity of the landlord made him willing to accept of this condition, and hence the origin of long leases. Even a tenant at will, who pays the full value of the land, is not altogether dependent upon the landlord the pecuniary advantages which they receive from one another are mutual and equal and such a tenant will expose neither his life nor his fortune in the service of the proprietor but if he has a lease for a long term of years he is altogether independent and his landlord must not expect from him even the most trifling service beyond what is either expressly stipulated in the lease or imposed upon him by the common and known law of the country the tenants having in this manner become independent, and the retainers being dismissed, the great proprietors were no longer capable of interrupting the regular execution of justice, or of disturbing the peace of the country. Having sold their birthright, not like Esau, for a mess of pottage in time of hunger and necessity, but in the wantonness of plenty, for trinkets and baubles, fitter to be the playthings of children than the serious pursuits of men, they became as insignificant as any substantial burgher or tradesman in a city. A regular government was established in the country as well as in the city, nobody having sufficient power to disturb its operations in the one any more than in the other. It does not, perhaps, relate to the present subject, but I cannot help remarking it that very old families, such as have possessed some considerable estate from father to son for many successive generations, are very rare in commercial countries. In countries which have little commerce, on the contrary, such as Wales or the highlands of Scotland, they are very common. The Arabian histories seem to be all full of genealogies, and there is a history written by a Tartar Khan which has been translated into several European languages, and which contains scarce anything else, a proof that ancient families are very common among those nations. In countries where a rich man can spend his revenue in no other way than by maintaining as many people as it can maintain, he is apt to run out, and his benevolence, it seems, is seldom so violent as to attempt to maintain more than he can afford but where he can spend the greatest revenue upon his own person, he frequently has no bounds to his expense, because he frequently has no bounds to his vanity, or to his affection for his own person. In commercial countries, therefore, riches, in spite of the most violent regulations of law to prevent their dissipation, very seldom remain long in the same family. Among simple nations, on the contrary, they frequently do, without any regulations of law, for among nations of shepherds, such as the Tartars and Arabs, the consumable nature of their property necessarily renders all such regulations impossible. A revolution of the greatest importance to the public happiness was in this manner brought about by two different orders of people, who had not the least intention to serve the public. To gratify the most childish vanity was the sole motive of the great proprietors. The merchants and artificers, much less ridiculous, acted merely from a view to their own interest, and in pursuit of their own peddler principle of turning a penny wherever a penny was to be got. Neither of them had either knowledge or foresight of that great revolution which the folly of the one and the industry of the other was gradually bringing about. 
it was thus that through the greater part of europe the commerce and manufactures of cities instead of being the effect have been the cause and occasion of the improvement and cultivation of the country this order however being contrary to the natural course of things is necessarily both slow and uncertain compare the slow progress of those european countries of which the wealth depends very much upon their commerce and manufactures with the rapid advance of our north american colonies of which the wealth is founded altogether in agriculture through the greater part of europe the number of inhabitants is not supposed to double in less than five hundred years in several of our north american colonies it is found to double in twenty or five and twenty years in europe the law of primogeniture and perpetuities of different kinds prevent the division of great estates and thereby hinder the multiplication of small proprietors a small proprietor however who knows every part of his little territory views it with all the affection which property especially small property naturally inspires and who upon that account takes pleasure not only in cultivating but in adorning it is generally of all improvers the most industrious the most intelligent and the most successful the same regulations besides keep so much land out of the market that there are always more capitals to buy than there is land to sell so that what is sold always sells at a monopoly price the rent never pays the interest of the purchase money and is besides burdened with repairs and other occasional charges to which the interest of money is not liable to purchase land is everywhere in europe a most unprofitable employment of a small capital for the sake of the superior security indeed a man of moderate circumstances when he retires from business will sometimes choose to lay out his little capital in land a man of profession too whose revenue is derived from another source often loves to secure his savings in the same way but a young man who instead of applying to trade or to some profession should employ a capital of two or three thousand pounds in the purchase and cultivation of a small piece of land might indeed expect to live very happily and very independently but must bid adieu for ever to all hope of either great fortune or great illustration which by a different employment of his stock he might have had the same chance of acquiring with other people such a person too though he cannot aspire at being a proprietor will often disdain to be a farmer the small quantity of land therefore which is brought to market and the high price of what is brought thither prevents a great number of capitals from being employed in its cultivation and improvement which would otherwise have taken that direction in north america on the contrary fifty or sixty pounds is often found a sufficient stock to begin a plantation with the purchase and improvement of uncultivated land is there the most profitable employment of the smallest as well as of the greatest capitals and the most direct road to all the fortune and illustration which can be required in that country such land indeed is in north america to be had almost for nothing or at a price much below the value of the natural produce a thing impossible in europe or indeed any country where all lands have long been private property if landed estates however were divided equally among all the children upon the death of any proprietor who left a numerous family the estate would generally be sold so much land would come to market that it could no longer sell at a monopoly price the free rent of the land would go no nearer to pay the interest of the purchase money and a small capital might be employed in purchasing land as profitable as in any other way england on account of the natural fertility of the soil of the great extent of the sea-coast in proportion to that of the whole country and of the many navigable rivers which run through it and afford the conveniency of water carriage to some of the most inland parts of it is perhaps as well fitted by nature as any large country in europe to be the seat of foreign commerce of manufactures for distant sale and of all the improvements which these can occasion from the beginning of the reign of elizabeth too the english legislature has been peculiarly attentive to the interest of commerce and manufactures and in reality there is no country in europe holland itself not excepted of which the law is upon the whole more favorable to this sort of industry commerce and manufactures have accordingly been continually advancing during all this period the cultivation and improvement of the country has no doubt been gradually advancing too but it seems to have followed slowly and at a distance the more rapid progress of commerce and manufactures the greater part of the country must probably have been cultivated before the reign of elizabeth 
and a very great part of it still remains uncultivated, and the cultivation of the far greater part much inferior to what it might be. The law of England, however, favors agriculture, not only indirectly, by the protection of commerce, but by several direct encouragements. Except in times of scarcity, the exportation of corn is not only free, but encouraged by a bounty. In times of moderate plenty, the importation of foreign corn is loaded with duties that amount to a prohibition. The importation of live cattle, except from Ireland, is prohibited at all times, and it is but of late that it was permitted from thence. Those who cultivate the land, therefore, have a monopoly against their countrymen for the two greatest and most important articles of land produce, bread and butcher's meat. These encouragements, although at bottom, perhaps as I shall endeavour to show hereafter, altogether illusory, sufficiently demonstrate at least the good intention of the legislature to favour agriculture. But what is of much more importance than all of them, the yeomanry of England are rendered as secure, as independent, and as respectable as law can make them. No country, therefore, which the right of primogeniture takes place, which pays tithes, and where perpetuities, though contrary to the spirit of the law, are admitted in some cases, can give more encouragement to agriculture than England. Such, however, notwithstanding, is the state of cultivation. What would it have been, had the law given no direct encouragement to agriculture besides what arises indirectly from the progress of commerce, and had left the yeomanry in the same condition as in most other countries of Europe? It is now more than two hundred years since the beginning of the reign of Elizabeth, a period as long as the course of human prosperity usually endures. France seems to have had a considerable share of foreign commerce, near a century before England was distinguished as a commercial country. The marine of France was considerable, according to the notions of the times, before the expedition of Charles the Eighth to Nepal's. The cultivation and improvement of France, however, is, upon the whole, inferior to that of England. The law of the country has never given the same direct encouragement to agriculture. The foreign commerce of Spain and Portugal to the other parts of Europe, though chiefly carried on in foreign ships, is very considerable that to their colonies is carried on in their own and is much greater on account of the great riches and extent of those colonies but it has never introduced any considerable manufactures for distant sale into either of those countries and the greater part of both still remains uncultivated the foreign commerce of portugal is of older standing than that of any great country in europe except italy Italy is the only great country of Europe which seems to have been cultivated and improved in every part by means of foreign commerce and manufactures for distant sale. Before the invasion of Charles the Eighth, Italy, according to Guicardini, was cultivated not less in the most mountainous and barren parts of the country than in the plainest and most fertile. The advantageous situation of the country and the great number of independent states which at that time subsisted in it probably contributed not a little to this general cultivation. It is not impossible, too, notwithstanding this general expression of one of the most judicious and reserved of modern historians, that Italy was not at that time better cultivated than England is at present. The capital, however, that is acquired to any country by commerce and manufactures is always a very precarious and uncertain possession, till some part of it has been secured and realized in the cultivation and improvement of its lands. A merchant, it has been said, very properly, is not necessarily the citizen of any particular country. It is in a great measure indifferent to him from what place he carries on his trade, and a very trifling disgust will make him remove his capital, and, together with it, all the industry which it supports, from one country to another. No part of it can be said to belong to any particular country, till it has been spread, as it were, over the face of that country, either in buildings or in the lasting improvement of lands. No vestige now remains of the great wealth said to have been possessed by the greater part of the Hans towns, except in the obscure histories of the 13th and 14th centuries. It is even uncertain where some of them were situated, or to what towns in Europe the Latin names given to some of them belong. But though the misfortunes of Italy, in the end of the 15th and beginning of the 16th century, greatly diminished the commerce and manufactures of the cities of Lombardy and Tuscany, those countries still continue to be among the most populous and best cultivated in Europe. The civil wars of Flanders and the Spanish government which succeeded them chased away the great commerce of Antwerp, Ghent, and Bruges. 
but Flanders still continues to be one of the richest, best cultivated, and most populous provinces of Europe. The ordinary revolutions of war and government easily dry up the sources of that wealth which arises from commerce only. That which arises from the more solid improvements of agriculture is much more durable and cannot be destroyed but by those more violent convulsions occasioned by the depredations of hostile and barbarous nations continued for a century or two together, such as those that happened for some time before and after the fall of the Roman Empire in the western provinces of Europe. End of Book 3, Chapter 4 End of Book 3 of The Different Progress of Opulence in Different Nations of the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith